Greetings, everyone. I want to welcome all of us at Center Street Church, those of us here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Bear Spa, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. Also want to welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, we are studying the book of Revelation, and we are looking at Jesus' message to the seven churches. Uh, these were seven historical congregations that existed during the time of the Apostle John. Of course, there were more than seven churches during the time, so why address only seven churches? Seven is the number of completion. So that is another way of saying Jesus is speaking to all the churches. Now, one of the repeated commands common to this section is, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that means these letters were not just for the first century church. We can learn from them. They are relevant to us. They present a mirror before us. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us through these letters. It's fascinating to see that the issues that were addressed in these seven churches are issues churches have wrestled with in every age, in every time period in history. So these letters are pertinent, and they speak to the times that we live in. And we need to listen to what Jesus has to say to us here at Center Street Church through these seven letters. When Jesus commends the churches for what they are doing well, we need to ask ourselves, are we excelling in the areas that are close to the heart of Jesus? And when Jesus reprimands the churches, we need to take that seriously. Those are areas we need to avoid. We learn from their mistakes so we don't repeat them. So far in this series, we have looked at the church at Ephesus that had forsaken its first love, the church in Smyrna that remained faithful in the midst of persecution. Last weekend, we heard from Pastor Henry about the church in Pergamum that compromised. Today, we're going to look at a church that had no conviction, a church that accommodated to the culture. It tolerated false teachings, and as a result, they lost their bearings. We're going to look at Jesus' message to the church in Thyatira, and our text is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. If you're physically able, I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word, Revelation 2, 18 to 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you pray with me? Lord, that is our prayer today, that you will give us ears that hear what the Spirit says. 
that you will give us a heart that is sensitive to all that you have to say to us. Even when the truth is difficult for us to receive, and these are hard truths, but I pray that we will be humble and receptive to you. So Lord, we give you full control. Uh, speak to us now in the power of your Spirit. Uh, we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let me start us off with a question. Think about this for a moment. How will your life be different if you didn't believe in Jesus? What will your life look like if you never came to faith in Christ? Now, the underlying assumption behind that question is, if you come to faith in Christ, your life ought to be different. You will be transformed. You will not conduct your life in the same way as a non-Christian who does not hold the same belief system as you do. See, there are some core fundamental convictions that anchor us. They undergird our lives as followers of Christ. That's what makes us different from the rest of humanity. But when the church starts to look like the rest of the world, it's often because we have compromised on our convictions. We have no solid foundation on which we stand on the essential matters of life. When anything and everything goes, when we don't have biblical standards, we start tolerating things that we should not tolerate. And that is a problem. That's what happened centuries earlier in the church in Thyatira. This is the longest of the seven letters in Revelation. Compared to some of the other cities mentioned, Thyatira was small and relatively insignificant. A population, about 25,000 people. That's it. The city was not culturally or politically important, but this small city was a prosperous trading center. Thyatira was known for its manufacturing industries like weaving, dyeing clothes, pottery, tannery, and so on. Now, one of the well-known people from the city was Lydia. In the book of Acts, we see Lydia is one of the first converts of the Apostle Paul in the city of Philippi. Lydia was a seller of uh, purple fabric, and she originally was from Thyatira. As some say, it's because of Lydia's influence, the church started in Thyatira. Now, as you read the seven letters, the introductory statement of Jesus is unique to the churches. And this is what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira, verse 18 of our text. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. If you ever had a laser surgery, you know how powerful light is that this special light beam has the ability to just cut through. And that is the imagery used here in our, in our text. Jesus' eyes are like blazing fire, like beaming laser. His eyes are bright and radiant, and it pierces through the darkness. Nothing escapes his attention. Of course, this is just a figure of speech, doesn't mean Jesus has eyes literally shooting laser beams. That'll be kind of cool, like Superman, but that's not what the text means. It's using it symbolically, right? These are eyes that can see through. Feet like bronze signifies the stability of Jesus. He's unshakable, he's strong, and he can trample every opposition that comes against his church. And our text says these are the words of the Son of God. The only time this phrase, Son of God, occurs in the entire book of Revelation. 
And you know what else is interesting? The people of Thyatira worshipped the god Apollo, who was the son of Zeus. The Roman emperor Caesar was seen as the incarnation of Apollo, so Caesar was called the son of God. And here Jesus reminds the church who the real Son of God is. It's not Caesar. He's not the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. The book of Revelation specializes in giving us an alternate reality. Don't settle for what you see with your natural eyes. If you look through your natural eyes, it may appear to you that Caesar is the Son of God. But if you see through your eyes of faith, your spiritual eyes, it's a different reality. Caesar is not on the throne. Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God who has all power and authority. That is a conviction of the church that stabilizes us no matter what oppositions we face. You surrender that conviction. You will be shaken when you face trials. But when you hold on to it, you will endure any and every challenge that comes your way. Now let's unpack Jesus' message to the church in Thyatira. Jesus starts off with some good things. He has some good things to say about this church. Verse 19. I know your deeds, your love, and faith your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now, if you remember the first church at Ephesus, they started off well, but they lost their way. And Jesus urges the church in Ephesus to do the works that they did in the beginning. They were better at first than they were now. And the situation in Thyatira was the exact opposite, opposite of Ephesus. They were doing better now than when they started. See, the church at Ephesus was doctrinally sound. They had the right convictions. They figured that out. But they became so rigid, and in the process, they forsook their love for God and for one another. But here in Thyatira, they were doing great in their works. Their love was expressed in service. They were getting better at it. They were doing more than they did at first. So that shows a sign of progress and maturity. They had such zeal for good works. They were actively involved in serving and meeting the needs of the community around them. But they were weak in the doctrinal matters of the faith. You know, all through the centuries, the pendulum has just swung back and forth between these two spectrums. On the one hand, we have sound faith, and then on the other hand, we have good deeds. And when the church emphasizes only sound faith, doctrinal purity, teaching the Bible, gaining intellectual knowledge, but ignores service to the community and sacrificial deeds, we have a problem. We will end up with a dry religion that's mere head knowledge. Now, in the same way, when the church is on the other end of the spectrum, when they emphasize only service and good deeds, but they ignore the biblical convictions, the core doctrines that serve as foundation, we have a problem. You may have a church that's busy doing a lot of different things, but their biblical foundation is weak, and they can be easily led astray. Now, you have to keep in mind, sound faith and good deeds are not opposites. See, our deeds flow out of our faith, our convictions. Rock-solid convictions lead to action. It results in a fruitful way of living. They go hand in hand. It ought to be intertwined. But the problem in Thyatira was they were great in showing love and serving sacrificially, but they didn't have sound doctrine. 
So they tolerated false teachers who brought compromise into the church. Now look at that text in verse 20. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Jesus had some good things to say, but now he's saying, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. A well-known woman in the congregation functioned as a prophetic figure who brought words from God. The issue is not her gender, but the message that she communicated. The name Jezebel is used as a symbolic figure. I don't think it's the real name of that person. And I don't know of anybody in their right mind who would want to give the name Jezebel to their child. So the Jezebel referred to here in Thyatira was more like the Old Testament counterpart in the book of Kings. King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, was notorious. And she led the entire nation of Israel in the worship of Baal. That Jezebel in the Old Testament used her influence to convince the Israelites one could worship Baal and Yahweh together, that worship of these two gods can somehow coexist. But true prophets like Elijah pointed out, no, you can worship both Baal and Yahweh. You have to make a choice. You have to draw a line of distinction. It's not a both and, it's an either or. But this so-called prophetess in Thyatira built a case for accommodation in the church. Here's some background information for you. Thyatira was a blue-collar town. And as I mentioned, they had several manufacturing industries. And each industry had its own trade guilds. It's the forerunner to the modern-day trade unions. And there was economic benefit in being part of these trade guilds. It offered protection and security and helped your business to thrive. But here's the catch. The trade guilds all had their membership requirements. And it involved participating in a common meal together. Each trade guild had its own patron deity. So meetings started with the worship of the deity, meat offered as sacrifices to the idols, and then everyone partaking of it together as an act of worship. And following the meal began the sexual orgies, and it's like a wild party going out of control. Now, if you're a worshiper of pagan deities, then that's a place to be. But what do you do if you are a worshiper of Jesus Christ? Can you, in good conscience, be in a place where your faith is compromised? Where you will be tempted to succumb to the values of the culture? A place where you're forced to look like everybody else just for economic benefit? But if you don't get membership in the trade guild, you will be faced with economic loss. You lose your livelihood. You will not be able to feed your family. What do you do? See, that's the kind of moral dilemma that the church has faced under the Roman Empire. And Jezebel, this prophetess in the church in Thyatira, claimed... I have news for you, church. You don't have to worry about this moral dilemma. Don't commit economic suicide. You can follow Jesus, and you can also take membership in the trade guild. She went on to reason, loving people means accepting their beliefs. After all, aren't we called to be more loving? 
And participating in these pagan rituals or sexual orgies is just external. What really matters is the heart. If your heart is committed to Jesus, that's all that counts. Now, prophetic figures who communicate what the people want to hear, who downplay the cost of discipleship, quickly climb the popularity charts. Jezebel in Thyatira was advocating for compartmentalizing the faith. Here's one set of values when you're in church or you're doing Bible study with other Christians, but live by a different contradictory set of values when you're rubbing shoulders with the rest of the world. Business, politics, education, social life, these are different spheres. You can't bring your Christian convictions there. Just leave them at the door. You're a Christian when you go to church Sunday morning, but live like everybody else the rest of the six days. Do you know what Jesus says to the church in Thyatira? The first part of verse 20, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. This is what Jesus was holding against this church. You tolerate Jezebel and her teachings. Huh? Tolerate. Jesus is not just upset with Jezebel's teaching and her line of reasoning, but he is livid at the church for tolerating those very teachings. Now, wait a minute. Isn't tolerance a good thing? Should we all not be more tolerant? And in the world that we live in, in our culture today, tolerance is the most important virtue, more than any other. You can be a pedophile and get some sympathy, but if you are intolerant, that is the worst crime that you could possibly commit according to our culture. And this accusation of intolerance or being bigoted keeps us from speaking the truth. Now let me tell you something. Tolerance, rightly understood, is a good virtue. We need to be tolerant of one another. The question is, how are we defining the word tolerance? Dr. D.A. Carson, who is a respected Christian scholar, has a book titled, The Intolerance of Tolerance. And here he points out the subtle change in the definition of the word tolerance that has taken place recently. Historically speaking, tolerance is to accept the existence of different views, to recognize and respect without agreeing or sympathizing. Tolerance is granting people the right to hold different views, even if they are wrong. That is commendable. If that is the definition of tolerance, then, of course, we all need to be more tolerant. But now, in our culture, the meaning of the word tolerance has changed. It's no longer merely accepting the existence of different views, but tolerance is accepting all the different views as equal. It's not just giving people the right to be wrong, but it now means nobody is wrong. So if you identify yourself as a cat, you are a cat, your view is right, and anybody who fails to accept that is bigoted. That is a culture's line of reasoning. Listen to these words of Dr. D.A. Carson as he writes. To accept that a different or opposing position exists and deserves a right to exist is one thing. To accept the position itself means that one is no longer opposing it. 
the new tolerance suggests that actually accepting another's position means believing that position to be true or at least as true as your own. We move from allowing the free expression of contrary opinions to the acceptance of all opinions. We leap from permitting the articulation of beliefs and claims with which we do not agree to asserting that all beliefs and claims are equally valid. Thus, we slide from the old tolerance to the new. We can respect differing opinions and even strive to understand them, but we cannot give our affirmation to every belief and behavior. And we have a problem when the church starts to tolerate in this new sense of the word. It's one thing to respect people of other faiths. But when we start affirming every religion is valid and acceptable ways to God, we fail to live by our convictions as a church. It's one thing to extend love to people of different sexual orientation. But when we start affirming their lifestyle and endorse it as normal, we fail to live by our convictions as a church. And that's what happened centuries ago in Thyatira. They failed to draw a line of distinction. And Jesus is not just critiquing the false teaching, but he's critiquing the church for tolerating the false teaching. Instead of getting rid of it, they merely put up with it. And Jesus is not pleased with such a church. Now let me give you a, a caveat. There are some non-essential issues and you don't want to be dogmatic on those issues. That's not what I'm talking about or arguing for. But there are some core issues that are foundational to the Scripture. The moment we let go of those convictions, the church will collapse because the foundation has become so unstable. And you look at history and you will see time and again how many churches, Christian denominations, and Christian institutions have fallen merely because they tolerated and compromised. When they tolerated, when they cave in, caved in and failed to hold on to the core convictions, that was the beginning of their decline and their ultimate demise. So Jesus calls the church to repent. And what we have here in the text are strong words in your face, not sugar-coated stuff. But Jesus is presenting some hard truths here, difficult for our culture to even digest. Listen to this, verses 21 to 23. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds." Sobering words. Jesus is talking about discipline. He will discipline Jezebel. And when he talks about striking her children dead, what Jesus is saying is he will remove the followers of Jezebel. He will disfellowship them from the church. When we persist in sin, when we insist on going our own way, the most loving thing for God to do is to discipline us. It is painful. 
but it's necessary and it brings correction. When we read these words, we may think Jesus is being harsh here. But I want you to think about this. Jesus is giving even Jezebel an opportunity to repent. Someone as diabolic as Jezebel bent on causing trouble is given an opportunity to change and get into a right relationship with God. That, I tell you, is grace at work. No one is too far gone. It doesn't matter where you are in your walk with God. When you repent, when you receive his forgiveness, you can be back in alignment with Jesus. You know, as these letters always do, they end with an encouragement, a promise for those who persevere till the very end. We can already see from the text that not everyone in the church in Thyatira chose to accommodate. Some of them remained anchored in their faith. And Jesus says to them, hold on. Don't lose your convictions. Maintain your grip. Keep persevering. And here is his promise to those who are faithful. Verses 26 to 28 Jesus says, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. And what we see here in the text is a reference to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. And God says clearly in Psalm 2, I will hand all authority to the Son. For He is the rightful ruler and He will reign over all the nations. You can see the overtones between Revelation 2 and Psalm 2 here in these words. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. So it's talking about the future reign of the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. All the nations are His inheritance. They will all bow down before His Lordship. No opposition of any kind can withstand. Every other kingdom will go down. The Roman Empire, as strong as it was with all of their pomp and glory, will go on to bite the dust, but the kingdom of Jesus will remain forever. And the promise here for those who belong to Jesus' kingdom is we will reign with Jesus. We may face difficulties now, but our rewards await us. And that's what spurs us on the moment we face trials and oppositions for our faith. So never compromise on the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the one and only king. Every opposition will bow down before him. They don't stand a chance. And do you know what else Jesus promises? He says in verse 28, I will also give that one, the one who perseveres, the morning star. And what's the morning star referring to? It's referring to Jesus himself. For later in Revelation 22, verse 16 It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Jesus is the bright morning star. So when our text says, I will give you the morning star, it means Jesus gives us himself. Jesus is our ultimate reward. For there will come a day 
when there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, and we will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus forever. That is our ultimate reward. And on the day, all the nations of the earth, every single people group, language group that God has made will acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and we will be in the presence of Jesus forever. So that hope is what sustains us today. I'm going to transition our time now to celebrating the Lord's Supper. The presence of Jesus is our greatest reward. And one day, we will experience the fullness of Jesus' presence. But we don't wait for eternity. We can experience a measure of Jesus' presence today. But every time we worship, every time we fix our eyes on Jesus now, we get a little glimpse of the glory that's about to be unveiled in the future. And one of the highest expressions of worship is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. It's an act of remembrance. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the Lordship of Christ. He died for our sins. He defeated death. Death did not have the final say on Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. He is our victorious Savior and Lord, and we await His coming when we will reign with Him forever. And the Lord's Supper is a symbolic way of declaring our core convictions. It serves as a means to remember, experience, and encounter the presence of Jesus. The bread and the cup are symbolic of the, the body and the blood of Jesus. And when we partake of these elements by faith, we feed on Christ and we experience Him in a fresh new way. When we eat the bread, and we say, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And we drink from the cup and we say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed for me. We are nourished and strengthened spiritually. So every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, we preach the gospel to ourselves and we are strengthened on the inside. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we also take time to reflect, to pause, and to ask the question, are we tolerating things in our life that Jesus will not tolerate? And if something comes to your mind, then this is the time for you to confess, to receive Jesus' forgiveness, and to be once again in alignment with Him, His plan, and His will for your life. So I'm going to give us a moment to just close our eyes and examine our hearts so we can ask the question in all honesty before the one whose eyes can see through. Are you tolerating things in your life that Jesus will not tolerate? If so, then this is a time to confess and receive forgiveness. So let's maintain a moment of silence.
Lord, in the quietness of this moment, we want to be honest with you in acknowledging our shortcomings, the areas where we let you down, the things that we tolerate in our life that you will not tolerate. But thank you, Lord, that you are a good and gracious God who gives us the opportunity to repent, to change our ways, to receive forgiveness, and you give us a fresh start. So we receive that today. The assurance of our sins being washed, that we have access to your presence. We stand before you, your throne of grace, as children who've been bought by the blood of Jesus. So even as we partake of these elements, would you nourish us and strengthen us and give us the resolve to live our lives, to persevere in this journey of discipleship for your glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask all of us to stand right now, and even as you're standing, you can have your elements ready. A couple of layers that you need to peel, just remove the top layer and you'll be able to get hold of the bread. And then there's another layer that you just need to peel to be able to drink from the cup. I want to read the words of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The body of Jesus was given for us. So we have access to His presence. And Jesus' promise to each one of us is, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's partake of the bread with gratitude. The blood of Jesus was shed not just for us, but for every nation, every language and people group. That one day Jesus will receive the worship of all of his creation. So all hail King Jesus. Let's partake of this with gratitude. 